Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome to another hour dedicated to inquiry, reflection, questions, possibilities, philosophical quandaries, uncovering dissonance, and a whole lot more. All in our effort to understand exactly what enlightenment means and what it is to be enlightened. Indeed, an hour dedicated to learning something more about ourselves, an hour designed to help us go further inward and perhaps challenge some of those old ideas about the world we live in and the people we have become. This is an hour where we strive to evaluate knowledge as inseparable from the total experience of reality. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, each week I read a few of your letters as our way of paying respect to the importance you play in helping us to shape our show and improve it in every way. Great show. Thanks, Ellen and David. This is a great topic that deserves more than an hour. Maybe David will grace us with his presence again soon. My mom's death 18 years ago definitely has sparked my interest in life after death and spurred me into the hospice field. I had many of the same experiences David describes which, not knowing him, nor having even read his books, I do feel there must be something to this. All right, it's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but I do invite you to opine by sending your email to eldon at eldontaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook. You can also just leave comments on my website. I do try to read all of your letters, and they do impact our programming. I highly value your input, so once again, thank you, all of you, for your feedback and comments. Following our our interview with Don Bauman, and suggested she could answer many of our callers' questions. If you remember, Don shared a number of stories about animal communicators, but she is not an animal communicator herself, and many of your questions were directed toward that end. So I read Carol's book, and she's here today to discuss her experiences, especially those with her two horse friends, Buddy and Ellie, and to answer your questions about your animals and animal communication. All right. Now, I'm going to get this stated right off the bat because this is provocative enlightenment. I'm soft on pets and I love animals. And so I tend to want to believe a whole bunch of things that maybe I would question if I wasn't so inclined. Around my place, you'll find dogs, cats, parrots, doves, chickens, and my personal addiction, horses. And that's just the domestic creatures. We also have coyotes, deer, skunk, badgers, raccoons, squirrels, owls, hawks, and so many more hanging around our little ranch. But we tend to just let them be. Here's my point. I don't know how you prove or disprove much about animal communication. There are lots of anecdotal pieces of evidence. So unless the claim is absolutely outrageous, again, I tend to let it go. That said... I welcome your calls, questions, and feedback, so call us today and take advantage of this opportunity to speak directly to the proverbial horse's mouth. No pun intended. You can join us. All right, the glorious horse, Equus, possessor of magic in both our imagination and our history. Those of you that know me are aware that for many years I owned a large all-breed stallion station and racing stable. Indeed, I was a licensed racehorse trainer, and I officiated as the paddock judge at more than one sanctioned quarter horse meet. That said, I opposed much of what the horse racing industry did then, and I still do now. I don't know how many of you know this, but a dozen years ago, a horse by the name of Charismatic won the 125th Kentucky Derby and the Preakness Stakes. He nearly went on to win horse racing's Triple Crown before he tragically broke his leg near the finish line at the Belmont Stakes. Unlike Barbaro, Eight Bells, and the more than one hundred or the more than one thousand U.S. racehorses that suffer fatal breakdowns on the track every year, Charismatic survived and was sold soon after like a commodity and exported to Japan for breeding purposes. Today, with his value as a stallion plummeting, Charismatic could be facing the same fate as fellow Kentucky Derby winner Ferdinand, who was slaughtered for dog food at the end of an unsuccessful stud career in Japan but not until after winning more money than any other horse at the time. According to PETA, in 2008, more than 100,000 American-bred horses were exported to Canada, Mexico, and Japan and slaughtered for meat. Beef growers would relish the idea of a ban on exporting, exporting horse and or the slaughter of horse for meat. What is it, then, about the horse that makes it special to so many? Why is it okay to eat beef and the like, but not dog or horse? 
Obviously, this is a cultural matter, but what is there in our culture, our heritage, the myths we live by, that makes it taboo to serve horse for dinner? Carol Devereaux has spent years researching and writing about the myth of the horse. She has been teaching people to communicate with her animals for 15 years. She is a leading animal communication consultant with a private practice that is spreading around the world. Carol has consulted with thousands of individual pet owners, breeders, and trainers in the United States, Europe, and Canada. She has studied energy healing and animal telepathy under the tutelage of pioneers in the field. Carol maintains a consulting website, teaches college courses in animal communication, and conducts residential retreats at her 10-acre farm in rural Washington State. As stated earlier, her latest book is titled Spirit of the Horse. So let's bring her to the show. Sorry for the difficulties there, Carol. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Carol Devereaux. Good morning. Happy to hear your voice. <laughs> it's good to hear your voice, too. You can't believe how good that is after our period of darkness here. Let's begin by having you tell everyone out there how you began your your career, your dialogue uh, with animals, and, and, and specifically with Buddy and Ellie. Well, it, it basically was not uh, something that I <clears throat> went after as, you know, an adult uh, would go to college and study uh, a subject and, and get professional, you know, into into that as a profession. It was a calling that I uh, that I answered and it was it was it became my life's mission. So I fell into becoming an animal communicator. I didn't really know what I was going to be doing until I got married and I moved to Portland, Oregon and we bought a 16-acre farm and that was my first experience living in Portland. So I looked at the land and I said, "Well, gee, I'd love to have a horse." And that was the first time I'd ever had a horse, so I found oh. Buddy and Buddy ended up being <clears throat> the um you know, became my spiritual director, basically, uh, you know, a spirit that came into an animal body who then pretty much directed my entire life, has directed my entire life for the last 20 years. Um, An incredible story, and I want to get to that. But you heard the setup piece, and, mm -hmm. and I know that you traveled to Europe in writing your book. Yeah. So what makes the idea of serving horse for dinner so disgusting in our culture? I mean, because it's not a universal matter. Indeed, I, I had a friend in Utah that advertised a pony for sale, uh -huh. and two Tongan brothers purchased the pony and killed it to the bottom of his driveway. Oh. It was the main course for some celebratory meal that they were having. So why the taboo in our culture? Well, I think that farm animals, you know, there's a farm animal mentality. So people raise pigs, goats, cows, chickens, and they use them for food. Now, in our culture, we have used animals uh, for food and for utility purposes. So horses were more used, I think, for, uh, you know, quote-unquote horsepower. They had to till the land. They, ha they were used to haul things. They were used to transport us. They weren't, they weren't needed for meat, in, in, at least in this country. Um, you know, in, his, in historical terms, horses were revered for their strength, their speed, and their ability to be adaptable to human needs. So you can't get on a cow and run across town. <clears throat> um, you can't do that with a chicken or, or a goat. I think, now this is just my opinion, this is, this is why we have revered horses. We don't revere them for their meat. We revere them for their speed, their intelligence, their adaptability. Um, and so they've made it. They've made it to a, a higher uh, place in the food chain. Yeah, you know, I, I would add to that, Carol, their companionship, and I know you yeah. would, too. I, right. I mean, I, you know, I have a couple of those very special horses, you know, that uh, I, I could come in from a ride and, and they'd get down in the alleyway, which was bedded in my barn with uh, wood shavings, and, and roll over. And I could go climb in the middle of my Cavalier Cowboy's horse I'm thinking of, climb in the middle of his belly and scratch him. Mm -hmm. I could go to sleep and drop his reins and, <laughs> and wake up and he was still. I mean, there's a great deal of companionship about horses that I think a lot of people because they're so large, you know, they're less inclined to be intimate with than, say, they would a cat or a dog. Uh -huh. Do you share that? Well, <clears throat> they're definitely uh, great companions, but then if you look at a chicken or you love goats, you have that same love. True, it's, true, it's true, all, true. It's all about, 
you know, the interspecies connection, which is spiritual. All right. When we come back, we've got a hard break coming up here, and hopefully we're going to have no more hiccups. But when we come back, let's pick up that spiritual side, and we'll go to our phones and and tell everybody out there, listen, if you want to uh, to speak to the proverbial horse's mouth, again, forgive the pun, no pun intended, uh, we have her on the line, Carol Devereaux. It's a real deal. Uh, and she's here to take your phone calls today. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment. My guest again is Carol Devereaux, and we're discussing her book, Spirit of the Horse, The New Myths of Equus. You uh, can go to the website, eldentaylor.com, and there under uh, Provocative Enlightenment, find the links to her website and her books. If you're in the chat room, be sure and stay tuned. Uh, we've got a couple of great videos that you'll want to do, do you want to watch? We'll be right back after these words from some of our friends. Every day, every moment, we face choices. Yet, how many of those choices are truly our own? Are you ready to step onto the path of discovery? Read Eldon Taylor's New York Times bestseller, Choices and Illusions. Now revised, updated, and expanded. Eldon combines provocative information, scientific research, and his own life's journey into a powerful message that we have the power to change. All we must do is be willing to choose to take the chance and change. Get your copy today from all bookstores. Have you talked to yourself lately? What does that inner voice say? Are you constantly hearing negative feedback? Ready for a change? Inner Talk. Eldon Taylor's patented subliminal technology can do just that. Change your inner self-talk. Turn off the negative by replacing it with positive affirmations. Inner talk has been researched at universities such as Stanford and by governments around the world and has been proven effective at priming your self-talk. Armed with a new positive outlook, you'll find everything becomes easier, from losing weight to stop smoking, giving presentations to riding horses. Learn new things to being a powerful salesperson. Choose your title for change today. Visit www.innertalk.com. That's I-N-N-E-R-T-A-L-K.com. Innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're discussing with Carol Devereaux her book, Spirit of the Horse, The New Myths of Equus. But before we get back to today's show, I want to invite you to check out our new Provocative Enlightenment website. Just go to ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. Also, how about liking our Facebook fan page for Provocative Enlightenment Radio? As a fan of the show... You will receive special announcements and incentives from time to time as our way of thanking you for your support. I would also like to invite you to join me on Facebook. And while you're there, and and, and, and Twitter, of course, too. Um, Now, let's, let's get back to the show. Before the break, we were discussing with Carol the spiritual nature of animals. Where do you want to pick that up, Carol? Okay, we seem to have lost Carol for a minute, so... Let's, uh, well, the board is getting her back on this show. And I, I don't know, this must be, what do we got, a full moon out there or something? Yeah, something. Is it just that Ravinder's not sitting <laughs> in the studio? It must be Ravinder. That's what you she's going to say. We need her back, yes. Yeah, she is going to say, that's because I wasn't there. <laughs> yes, of yeah. course she will. Yeah. Yeah, we miss her, but uh, yeah, hopefully she'll be back next week. But they tell us they lost the entire building. They had some kind of a connection problem. Let's see if we've got her back. Carol, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, hi. All right. Well, we're back from break, and I don't know what happened. Where'd you go? I was here. Did You <laughs> You were there all the time, yeah. huh? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, maybe the spirits of the horses are, are after us today. Do you think that's true? I don't know. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> Before the break, you were going to tell us about the spiritual side of the animals. Why don't we pick it up there, and then we'll take a couple of calls, huh? Okay. Well, what what you were mentioning was the companionship of horses and how we have become so close to them because they're so easily loved. <clears throat> and basically, um, you know, that's true in in a lot of ways, but there there are also um 
a lot of people who are in love with goats or in love with dogs or cats or even wild animals, wolves and chickens. And so the, the concept that I teach people and how we learn how to respect and honor the soul and being inside these different bodies, these different costumes, is I teach people to get in touch with their own inner soul and the inner essence or their spirit. And once they learn how to, uh, you know, invigorate themselves with that conversation, that inner conversation, they can then go to another being, a being in another costume, another physical body, and they can connect with that spirit in that other being, even plants and trees and all life has this essential essence that animates all physical matter. So that's what, that's what the concept is. It's to communicate with the spirit in the body. Not okay, now you, you, you pulled tears out of my eyes. I don't know if you heard that or not, but <laughs> I get to the end of your book, and you have the story of Buddy, uh-huh. uh, Buddy passing, and, right. and something that, uh, that very, very few people have ever witnessed, and that's Ellie. Uh, your mayor, right. crying over him. Uh, right. I know this has to be really painful to you because I relate, uh, but will you share this story with our audience? Well, it's not as painful as you might imagine because after Buddy died, I did connect with him, and we did have a long talk about why he had to leave that day, and there was <clears throat> you know, destiny involved and timing and everything. It was supposed to happen, and there was a reason. So once I learned that he was okay with what happened to him, then I was okay with it because what we decided was we were going to go on and continue to communicate uh, from the other side. And we were going to, he was going to stay in spirit with me. I had stretched my ability to the point where I could communicate with beings in bodies, and that was fine, and I did that. It took me a long time. And then the the whole <clears throat> subject tur- made a co- turned a corner basically, and, and he said to me, "We had we were stagnating. Our energy was stagnating." I had finished writing his section of the book, and I was very close to finishing the book. And he w- it was his time to move on. He was called to another place, and he had to answer that call. It's like the hero's journey that we um, experience on this planet. In his own way, he was called to his next um, experience. So when I found that out, I was pretty uh, relieved, you know, that he was okay with it. It made me feel okay with it, but basically he died, you know, one day from breaking his leg, and I had to put him down the same day. And, of course, it was the most heart-wrenching experience I've ever had in my lifetime at that moment, but I I got beyond it. And Ellie got beyond it, and we all moved on. And and since then, Buddy has been very inspirational still. He continues. His energy is still here, and his heart is still in, you know, it lives through all the people who read the book, who remember him. I have people who will never forget every word he ever said to them, and they can repeat that back to me. So I know he's still around in 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 his own in his own way. We have a number of questions out of our chat room about exactly that kind of a situation. What what happens with pets dying? But we have some phone calls, and our first caller is uh, calling us from Germany. So let's take that phone call on line one. We have Yuli. Yuli, is that you? Yes. <clears throat> Hello, Doctor Taylor. Hello. Welcome. Thanks for taking. Thanks for taking my call, and hello, Carol. Hello. Um, I got a new pet. I um, I had to put mine down two years ago, my female doggy, and uh, the, this dog I have now, he lived on the streets in south of Spain as a puppy, and then he was in a shelter, and he's about 10 months old, but I'm not sure at the moment. I'm having quite a hard time. I'm not sure if I'm on the right path with him, um, and... I'm not sure if he can cope with that quite lonely life I live. Um, I feel like he misses a lot his friends from the shelter. And um, at the moment, I just, I don't know what to do. I don't know if he's all right, Mm. if he wants to stay with me or if he 
And what's his that name? Will work out. What's his, his name is Yoshi. Yoshi? Yoshi, yes. Okay. He used to, his, his first name was Leon. They called him Leon first. Mm -hmm. And I changed his name to Yoshi. Okay. So uh, they, they found him on the streets of southern Spain? Yes. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay, so he's only 10 months old, is that right? Approximately, yes. Okay. Well, he's still a puppy, <clears throat> so anything that you can do for him to socialize him, because what, um, what he probably is missing is um, being in a pack, because dogs live in packs. So they want to have the social experience that they get from other dogs. And I get it that you don't have any other animals. That's right. That's right? So yes. can you take him to the park and walk him and let him, uh, you know, be around other dogs? I do that. Every every day I do that. Um, but um, people walk their dogs on the lead usually here, and it's not so easy. Um, I had to, I took him, I let him go a lot every day actually but uh, since a few days he just runs off for a while and then when he's by himself then he goes a bit mad and he keeps on running but he passes the house and then he looks at me when I'm standing on the door and then he, he just passes on he carries on um, walking or running and then he, he just goes back and forth like he doesn't know what to do he always comes back but uh, he's really a bit con very confused um, so uh, since one day now, well, since yesterday, I don't take him off the lead anymore. I just let him go in the in the little garden I got near next to the house. Uh huh. Well, have you ever heard of something called tea touch, Linda Tellington Jones? They, it's all over the world, and I know she's been to Germany. No. 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 Okay. Well, I, I couldn't really understand what it was. It's called tea touch, Tellington. Tea touch. touch. Key touch, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. um, it's a form of um, healing which you might want to work with with your dog because your dog may be having trouble get staying in his body because being on the streets and having to you know literally um, fend for your own survival causes an animal to be very <clears throat> distrustful of humans and also distrustful of the whole process of living. You know, life is life is dangerous, so. So he's probably got that hardwired into his brain already that, that uh, he is confused about how easy life can be. And one way to help him, it, also to communicate with him, but one way to help him is to get him back in his body, which means keeping him exer well exercised, but also doing massage techniques, which will help him feel his body. Because when an animal is on the street and it has to literally fend for its life, it goes, the spirit goes out of the body, you know, because it's so hard and so painful to be starving, to be dehydrated, to be exhausted. And so the spirit leaves the body just so it can survive that experience. When it comes back into the body, it has to deal literally with starvation, hung, you know, hunger and dehydration and all those things. So he doesn't know that he can safely be in his body. And one way you can do that to help him be in his body is to massage him. When you're sitting at home alone with him and he's quiet, put your hands on him and, and just gently massage all of his tight muscles. You, okay. Can, you can do that, right? Yes, of course. So yes. that's, okay. the first, that's the first thing I would recommend for him, of course, he probably needs a good diet and, and very healthy, you know, unprocessed organic food. Do you give him a, a, a premium diet? Yes, I'm giving him the best I can. Uh -huh. I, I've noticed he eats massive. He eats even more than my first dog. He was, she was twice as big. Um, but it, it seems like it just goes through and he loses lots and lots of hair. Uh, I have to vacuum clean every day. Oh. It's like um, it seems to me his body doesn't really take the nutrition out okay. of the food. So have you and, have uh, you had him blood tested at a veterinarian? No, I haven't. Done oh, you, you must do that because he could have a yeast infection. I've seen lots of dogs who have been on the street for, I've got a picture from a woman in, from Taiwan one time and the dog was pretty much bald. 
And basically what that dog was suffering from was a yeast infection. Um, and so there's all kinds of allergies that dogs can get once they have dropped below a normal level of nutrition. And, and this will be something that will help him come back up to a, a balanced state, both mentally and physically, is to have blood work done, test him for parasites, infection, uh, look at his teeth. He could have, you know, things going on in his mouth. He could have all kinds of things that the vet can help you resolve. And then once you get the physical things taken care of, you can work with him on the emotional problems. All right. Julie, thank you very much for calling. We wish you the best, huh? Thanks a lot, too. And um, uh, yes, uh, hi to Ravinda. <laughs> we, we all miss her. <laughs> I'll see that she gets that. Thanks. You have a great one. All right, let's go to line two and talk to Kelly from Austin, Texas. Kelly, you're on the line. Uh, do you have a question for our guest today? I do. I have a uh, off-the-track racehorse, so he's about 16 now, so he's been off the track for a long time, and and I would never sell him. And, you know, I, I've been working and trying to do animal communication, trying to learn how to do it. And with I have a little success, but, um, you know, not as much as I'd like. And can, is there any recommendations to really tapping in with my horse to really uh, – what's, what's the best way to communicate? Well, um, <clears throat> if you're completely new to the subject, I definitely recommend that you read – uh, a beginner's animal communication book called Animal Talk. Like, and I've actually read that, and I have had some success. I just I think it's harder with him than with my dogs for some reason. Uh -huh. With my horse, I don't know if there is. Well, you know, um, you know, the other thing, you know, reading books is one way to learn a subject, but the best way is to have a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I am doing um, a lot of marketing right now for finding sponsors to to sponsor workshops all across the country. Okay. So I travel and I and I put on workshops. So within a two to three day period, I have successfully been able to get people to sit down, quiet their mind, and get a very good, clear communication with their animal. So that would be the second way to start learning how to okay. communicate. And people who want to sponsor a workshop receive the workshop for free in exchange for getting 10 people to come. Oh, okay, great. So you can learn about that on my website. Okay. Give that give that website, uh, uh, Carol. It's animalinsights.com. dot Okay. It, thanks for Great. thanks Thank for calling, you. Kelly. Thank uh, you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Let's go to line three, and we'll talk to Mary Ellen out of Los Angeles. Mary Ellen, you're on the air. Have you got a question for Carol Devereaux? Yeah, I've got a a quick question. Um, I'm just wondering if she could uh, tap into my pooch, and uh, I think he's looking for a companion. But he's a, he was a pound puppy and hasn't taken quite well to other animals. So I'm wondering if this is a good idea or not. What's his name? Blaze. And what, what breed and size and color? Um, he is uh, mostly Anatolian Shepherd. He's huge. He's about 120, 25 pounds, uh, kind of yellow. Okay. Well, do you know what you have in that breed? Do you know what that dog is supposed to do? Uh, he's supposed to herd. Well, he's a loner. He doesn't, oh, really? Well, I mean, uh, his job, he's up all night. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's up all night. Do you have a farm? No. He belongs on a farm. Okay. He is, You have an apartment? I have a house with a yard. Yeah. He, those dogs are so specifically bred for one, well, for one specific purpose, um, and that's to guard the farm the farm uh, yard, the farm animals at night. Mm -hmm. So with, with him not being able to do that, he would be very frustrated. Um, I wouldn't think that getting a, uh, another dog would be the answer, especially if you don't have a, a big place for a dog to run. Mm -hmm. That dog needs a lot of exercise. He mm -hmm. has a lot of energy. He's up all night. Does he howl at night? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> he's like... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, the best thing you know I could recommend for you is to, for you to contact me offline, and and we could talk to him, uh, you know, through a, an animal communication session. I think it's too complicated to to just tap in, to, you know, very okay. slightly right now because what you have there is a big is a big project. Okay. You took on something that's quite complicated. 
He's, okay. he's not just this little lap dog. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he thinks he is, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure he's, he's got a great, loving personality, but for you to make the, the give him the best life he can have, mm-hmm. there's, there's, there's um, <clears throat> a bunch of things you would have to do differently. Okay. Okay, thank you. I will uh, get in touch with you. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate it. You have thank a great you. one. Uh-huh. Let's go to line four. We'll talk to Michelle out of Alberta, Canada. <laughs> You're Hi. on the air. You got a question, Michelle? Hi. Yeah, I do. I have a cat that um, we just got in, at Christmas, and uh, her name is Marcy. She's a very fearful cat, and she doesn't she doesn't really let us pet, even pet her once she accepted us. She actually pets us. You know, she'll come up to us and, and push into us. Rather right. Than, uh-huh. and I'm just wondering why would she be like that? Why would she be like that? Mm-hmm. Because she's a cat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and if you do, you, you've never had a cat before. Oh yes, and I actually had quite an uh, um, attachment with it, with the other cat. Uh huh. And I've, I'm starting to get an attachment with this one too. Like I like there's a good connection there. Uh huh. But um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> there's a big difference between cats born in the wild and cats born in a domestic environment. So you don't know where the cat was was found. No, you found, the, but you bought the cat at a shelter. Oh no, um, it was actually at um, a neighbor. So uh, I imagine that I don't think that they would have bought it. They would have probably. It was probably born in the wild. Yeah, well, cats born in the wild inherit this this incredible sense of their environment because it's it's darn scary to be born in you know outside. Mm-hmm. You don't know, and your mother <clears throat> literally downloads all these things. Uh, immediately to the kittens, like be be careful, listen d- deeply, um, don't go here, don't go there, and they they grow up in that environment. Uh, however long it takes them to be found or rescued, but they still come with those hardwired fears and feelings, which will change over time. But you have to does the does the animal go outside? No. See that's that's an issue because if the if an animal is born outside. They generally tend to want to hang out outside because they know what it's like and they feel comfortable in that environment. So one of the ways to get the cat to be um, more compatible with people is to let it go outside, but of course not, you know, not let her wander off. Mm -hmm. So I have a cat that, that was born outside and for the last 18 years, he's still alive. He, um, is very, he still continues to be completely detached from humans. And um, we asked him one time, why are you like that? And he said, because my mother told me to stay away from people. <laughs> and so he's protecting his, his innocent heart. He loves his mother. He still thinks about his mother, even though he's 18 years old. And so he tries to, he tries to keep his promise. And, and so that was a very sweet experience that I learned about cats, but in general, uh, cats that are born outside, they they really have a hard time integrating with being just indoors, Yeah, and, and they, they become very overstimulated. If you pet a cat too much, they will turn around and bite you because they're very sensitive, and you're putting all your energy in that tiny little body, yeah. and you look at how big people are and how much energy they're running, and then you look at the size of a cat. As soon as you touch a cat, you're transferring that energy, that electromagnetic energy. Mm-hmm. So they pick that up. And if it's not calm and quiet, they're going to let you know, I don't like that. <laughs> That's seems, their way of communicating with you. Sorry. Um, she licks herself after I pet her, too. It's, it's like um. Oh, yeah. You've got oils on your skin. <gasps> so they're very fastidiously clean. They love their, their fur to be clean. And if you have any dirt or oil on your fingers, fingertips, they're going to get rid of that. Okay. Yeah, and it's, you can learn a lot about cats um, by just observing them and not asking them to do anything that you would like. And they'll, be, they'll become curious about you at, at that point. If you open your heart and just say, you can be whoever you are and I love you unconditionally, they will come, they will come into your energetic uh, space. But may never become uh, sociable with other people, though, right? Um, <clears throat> if you know, sensitive. that's something that if you find when you have company, they quiet themselves and they're, they're very soft and um, not 
you know, raucous and loud around the cat, the cat may learn that people can be easily, you know, it, it, that people can, you can easily be in their presence. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michelle, for calling. All right. Bye bye. Uh huh. All right. Now, Carol, in uh, roughly 45 seconds, we have several questions out of the chat room, but this one is particularly important to me. If a pet dies, do they stay with you? Uh, I'd say generally yes. Uh, for as long as you need them, it's not a given, but if you're still connecting with them and your heart is broken, they're going to want to hang around and try to mend your broken heart. And as soon as you start to communicate with them from the other side, th- that experience will um, expand your enlight. You know that w- you will become enlightened about what it is like to be without a body and just be a spirit. So then, then the, their job will, may be done with you, and they can move on. Yeah, my experience says that is true. Give your website one more time. It's animalinsights.com. And the book is Spirit of the Horse and New Myths of Equus. Uh, this has been Carol Devereaux. You have her website. If you have more questions, uh, I invite you to go out there and check it out. We've come to the end of another hour of provocative enlightenment. I want to thank you all for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed our show, and we'll join us again next time, same time and same place. I apologize to you uh, if you were on the line and we were unable to take your calls. And I, we all extend here from Hay House Radio our apologies for the technical difficulties at the top of the show. Okay, until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. <laughs>